Michael Jordan is not only the best basketball player, but he's the most exciting basketball player to ever play. Tatum fires away, pumps it in. 51 for Jason Tatum. The Big 3 NBA podcast is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Welcome to another edition of the Big 3 NBA Podcast. I'm your host, Aisha Blakely, and this is brought to you by the good folks at Indeed.com, HelloFresh, and of course, Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Sign up now at prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. Our guest today uh, is the one, the only, Bobby Manning. Uh, for those of us who follow us and, and follow CLNS Network, Bobby is on every show, it seems like, uh, these days uh, as we get deeper into the NBA season, uh, but most known known for the Garden Report and the Dome Theory. How you doing, Bobby? Good. I play 80 games, Sherrod. That's what I'm aiming for this year. No load management for Bobby Manning. <laughs> Absolutely. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. Well, we're just going to kind of dive right into the conversation. And we're, the one thing that, uh, you know, that, that we've we've been seeing is kind of play out. And as we get closer to the end of the regular season, it's clear uh, the Celtics and their reign atop the Eastern Conference, across the NBA for that matter, has been steady throughout. And I, from your perspective, Bobby, where do the Celtics go from here? What do they need to amplify or get better at or just get a better feel for if they're going to be the last team standing i think that with rotations the lineups down the stretch are going to be the most interesting thing and uh, the one thing i've looked at over the last couple of games here those double big combinations looks like they want that to be part of what they do going into the playoffs and you're trying to integrate xavier tillman he played a decent r- run last game on that win over phoenix you still have luke cornett in the mix they tried running him and al together again al's out there with just about every combination of bigs that you have so that's the one that they're still tinkering with it feels like and the numbers aren't great with those looks out there the porzingis al one is and then if you're running those two together you're like all right are you throwing in a little luke minutes here there in the playoffs are you mixing in tillman we're starting with Luke Sherrod. <laughs> I, I was, I was, what Bobby? It, it's been less than five minutes, and I'm disappointed that it took you this long to bring up Luke. I was, I, I was totally expecting that within the first ninety seconds. I'm so disappointed in you. So yeah, I, they're figuring that out. I think the thing you've noticed too over the last handful of games. I know you want to get into this a little bit later. Are those Jalen and Jason rotations? When are they in the game? When are they out of the game? When are they out there together? When's it just Jalen out there by himself? And that's something as he's gotten more hot this. Uh, post All Star break run, they've tried to do with the second units, and it's working a little bit better than last year. I feel like with his improvements. So, those are the things I think, along with rest, along with experimentation in terms of like game plans that you're looking at down the stretch here, because you know your starting lineup's amazing. You know your top six you can rely on, but who's fitting into that seventh spot? when and where and who's out there those are all the things i still think they're trying to figure out to some degree as good as 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 consistent as they've been this year yeah you you touched on it earlier bobby about the double big lineup and it it seems that if if we're playing a game of family feud and the top five answers were what is the most polarizing thing that celtics fans kind of go back and forth over the double big lineup would be in their list uh, it seems that people either love or loathe that. Uh, what, what is it about that that particular aspect of the Celtics rotation that you think seems to kind of, uh, it, it tends to raise the hair of Celtics fans, uh, unlike very few things, Ken? I think it's the fact that when they're small, they're so dynamic. They've been at their best in recent years, just going with one big. And you had that 2022 season where it started with Rob and Al, and they found something there. And it worked on both ends. And ever since, it looks like they've been trying to get that back. Uh, Al, I think as he's, you know, he's still a good three-point shooter. He's up in the high 30s for most of the season. He's still hovering around 40. But there are games where he's off. And that's the only shot-making skill that he has left in his arsenal, it feels like. So when he's at that four, our guy's guarding him. I thought that was a big issue when they collapsed in that Cavaliers game a week or two ago now. They had that double big lineup out there, and they really weren't guarding Al. Uh, when you have Al and Tillman out there, those are two guys that uh, ha- aren't the best at taking you to the basket the way that the Celtics have done successfully this year. So when those units are out there, Luke and Al especially, like that's not a combination I love as much as I love Luke. You're a little more limited offensively, and this team's bread and butter over the last year or two here has been its offense. And 
you know, credit to Joe. I want to see a more defensive emphasis this year, and that's a big reason that they're going to those looks. They want an offensive rebound, and they've been good at it this year. I think they rank 14th in offensive rebounding after ranking like 25th last year. So uh, it's all helped them be a more rounded team. But in the playoffs, Sherrod, you want to go to what you're best at. And if they're tinkering around with some double big lineups and they lose four or five minutes in a game, that could swing a game. So do you want to go small with a Pritchard? Or do you want to go big with a coronet in your bench lineups in the playoffs? Those are the kind of questions you have to ask. And I think fans feel better about a Pritchard than a coronet. And I think that's a big reason that they don't love those double big looks. Well, I I, I understand why they feel that way. But the, the thing that I worry about in the playoffs is that to me, that there's very few teams where you can see the undeniable benefit of going double big like for example if you're playing cleveland i can't imagine you not having double bigs for a significant portion of that type of series because of the way that cavalier team is constructed but if you're looking at a team like maybe new york or a team that's you know uh doesn't have as many i think impact bigs uh you feel better about pritchard particularly the way he has played of late uh as far as whether he's playing 10 minutes or 20 minutes, he's pretty much giving you the same thing. Uh, and that's, that's been a positive, but what I wanted to kind of pivot to Bobby was uh, uh, looking at the Celtics and, and just looking at just how dominant they've been. Uh, they're not invincible. I don't think there's anyone who's followed this team who feels that, but when you look at the East landscape, what are some of the teams that come to mind that you think could be the greatest threat to the Celtics at this point? Because at this point, it really isn't so much about, uh, who are the Celtics better than? Because they've proven they're better than pretty much every team in the Eastern Conference. Uh, but who presents the greatest threat for them getting to the NBA Finals at this point, From just from your perspective? But most of the year, I felt like it's New York. But the Celtics are 4-0 against them. They're yes, so Bobby. hard right now. And Bobby, we've had that conversation. And you and you and as someone who at once upon a time a huge New York Knicks fan, I would love to co-sign on that, but I can't. No. Uh, but I want you to explain your rationale why you think the Knicks, even though the Celtics, as you put it out, Bobby, and I'm only using your numbers, Bobby. The Celtics are 4 0 against the Knicks. Yeah. So why why do you see them as a threat though? I, I think they're defensive. I think that they can slow the Celtics offense enough to stay in those games and they shoot the three well. That's something you need to stay in games with the Celtics. They have that motion offense that almost looks like what the Heat do uh, in those series that they've had played against each other. I look at their offense and it almost looks like with what they do with Jalen Brunson and you know, all the shooters around him and the big man rolling. Like It almost looks like those Heat teams that have given the Celtics a ton of trouble in recent years. So those games have been tight. Opening night, that was an awesome game. Mm -hmm. uh, even that last game in New York was tight up until the end. But as you said, as I said, the Celtics are 4-0. So it's hard to say that the Knicks are going to beat them in a series. It might be tight for five, six games. It might be four close games that the Celtics sweep them in. So I, I don't think I can go in that direction now, especially with Robinson up in the air. Randall, they're hoping he gets back in time for playoff time. Where's he at at that point? I don't think we know. And they're two big deadline additions in Bogdanovich and Burks. They just benched Burks last week. He's right. shooting 33% since the trade. Bogdanovich is only shooting 40% since the trade. So those deals haven't worked yet. Uh, and then you've had Brunson picking up some bones with bruises too. Hartenstein's banged up. So they're just so injured right now. I think I have to move off that. So I'm looking at the two and the three seeds right now, obviously. You know, the second and third best teams in the conference. Milwaukee, I haven't believed in all year. And I still haven't seen enough. I know they've won 7 of 10. I know that they've picked it up under Doc. But the defense is still hovering around league average. And it's tough for me to imagine a team that inconsistent on defense is going to make it to the finals. And a team that, you know, I watched them a couple of nights ago, starts uh, Beasley and Jay Crowder, who, you know, when you think of the Celtics starting lineup, their, you know, fourth and fifth options are Drew Holiday and Derek White. And the Bucks are going with two guys who really didn't play in the playoffs last year for the Lakers and Bucks, respectively. So mm -hmm. they're not deep enough. I don't think their defense is good enough. You got to respect Giannis, who's playing about as well as he ever has. So they're up there for me. But I talked to someone recently who I talked to last year when I was dealt in the Heat. And he told me, eh, you know, our numbers love the Heat. Like they are better than people think. And then they go on to make the finals. So I circled back with him recently. I was like, all right, who are your numbers like this year? You know, you told me the Heat last year. Who do you really like this year? And he said the Cavs. Uh, and 
Yeah, they just beat the Celtics last week, 22-point comeback without Mobley, without uh, Mitchell out there. Mitchell's back, playing well since he got back from the knee injury. Mobley should be back in a couple weeks here. Allen's been incredible this year. I think they fixed that small forward position with Max Struess and others uh, this year. They're still a little banged up, haven't had their guys in consistently this year. So if they can get healthy for the playoffs, much like the Knicks, and they get a good matchup round one because that Knicks matchup was really tough for them last year and they ended up losing early. If they make a run, I think they're a team. They got the defense. They got the size. They got the clutch performer in Mitchell, and that's been an issue for the Celtics this year, crunch time play. Obviously, their defense stacks up with Boston's. Is their offense good enough to actually beat Boston? I don't know. And this is why, Shred, you know, as we roll through all these teams, I, I – I think the Celtics are winning the East this year. It's tough for me to find a team that can really beat them four times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about the Cavs, to me, the the pathway to them surpassing the Celtics is for that offense to overachieve because as there's as they're constructed now, they're just not good enough to compete with the firepower of the Celtics. And their defense has to be comparable in the postseason to what we've seen thus far in the regular season for them to have a shot at beating Boston. And even if they do those things. I still like Boston's chances with it in seven, maybe if they play them. Uh, Milwaukee, you and I, I think I've kind of been at the at the hip as far as our not really feeling the Bucks. Uh, I, to me, their backcourt is too small. Their backcourt is too, I guess the nice way to put it, defensively deficient. I think is is the way I'm going to describe Beasley and Dame Lillard. And no matter what type of Doc Rivers Jedi mind tricks that he's able to play and, and mojo that he can produce, that's not going to change the fact that you have two, you're starting backcourt. It's not only undersized, but they're not defensive type people, players. And we all know in the playoffs, you're not going to get to, from one round to the next unless you have a core group that at least – embraces being a defensive t- minded team. And I just don't see that happening. And to your point about Jay Crowder, uh, I totally forgot that they had just kind of thrown him in the mix. And my visions of Jay Crowder are not the Jay Crowder that played for the Celtics, but the Jay Crowder that did not play at all, hardly for the Bucks. And when he did play, you understood real quickly why he wasn't playing. Um, yeah. He's just not the same guy anymore. And, and and Jay has had a great career, but you, you can tell when guys are on the downside of the career. And Jay, I think he's a little further down on the downside than you would want if you're talking about a title contender because he's such an he's a he's been an energy effort guy his entire career. And when you can't muster that up to the level that can help impact winning, uh, you're not really helping. He doesn't defend like he did. He doesn't shot, knock down no corner threes like he used to. I, I don't see a lot of value they're going to get out of him. And that's that's a problem for Milwaukee. That's a big problem. Yeah, and he made the mistake that Ben Simmons made. I think people forget now that he sat out for most of last year trying to get out of Phoenix and didn't go well for Ben Simmons doing that, missing that entire year with Philly and Brooklyn and Jay's similar situation. It had a ramp up with the Bucks after the trade. It got hurt this year, and he's been dealing with injuries on and off ever since. So he was a guy they brought in to be a Tatum stopper, to be a Brown stopper. And you need one of those guys. Uh, you need someone who can at least stand in front of those guys or someone who can deter them at the rim like Cleveland has. So I'm higher on Cleveland than them. And I hate to say it because I really respect Giannis. I think he it turns his motor on and doesn't stop until the last second of the last game in a series. Uh, so I have to respect them. I could see a series with them going six, seven games just because of those guys. They're an incredible clutch team. They've pulled out so many wins. Everyone's like, you know, they've said all year, Ooh, the Bucks are really struggling. They're the two seed, they're the three seed, but they're winning most of those games going down to the wire, coming back from down in those kind of games. So they can do that. They're dangerous. If you remember that first game, I know they're coming up in Boston this week, sure. But the first game of the year in Boston against them, I know the second game was that mess in Milwaukee, but the first game, the Celtics went up by a million and then Lillard just started draining threes and I think it got down to like six late in that game. So that's the kind of stuff the Bucs have done this year. I'm very interested to see them on Wednesday because I'm not completely ruling them out as being a challenge for the Celtics. I don't see them beating the Celtics, but if you get into a series with them in, let's say, the second round, which is unlikely but possible, it's probably a little bit of a harder second round series. Yeah. series than you want. And that's the thing I'm looking at, Sure, I think they're going to win the East. I think they should win the East. That should be the expectation. Mm-hmm. But let's say you get Miami round one 
or Philly round one with Embiid just coming back. That's not great. You're probably going to win the series, but it's going to be much tougher than you want to see in the first round. Yeah. And then let's say Milwaukee falls to four, and you see them in the second round. It's earlier than you want to see the Bucks, And then, I don't know, Knicks or Cavs in the East Finals. That's a tough road to the finals. You're probably winning all those series, but are you going six, seven games in each of those series? That's the kind of thing that burns you out a little bit when you get to the finals against Denver or whoever it would be. Hello everyone, this is Ashra Blakely, part of the CLNS Media Network, and I wanted to tell you about one of our friends, Prize Picks. It's the largest DFS, that's Daily Fantasy Sports, platform in North America. It is the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You want to play alongside some of Prize Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill or comedian Andrew Schultz? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Prize Picks is really simple to play. You can make your picks, submit your entries, and do this in less than 60 seconds. Yes, that's right, less than 60 seconds. Prize Picks offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts like Taco Tuesday. Who doesn't love Taco Tuesday? Every Tuesday, Prize Picks discounts select player projections up to 25% to provide even more value. Prize Picks also offers Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account as we count down these final weeks until the NBA playoffs start. As a longtime Fantasy League player myself, Prize Picks is the perfect what's next to satisfy my Fantasy League itch. You want in too? Here's what you have to do. First, you got to go to prizepicks.com slash CLNS and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's right. Prizepicks.com slash CLNS. Use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. So, that being said, you get a chance to pick more. You can pick less. It's that easy. For the Celtics, again, for them to make that that journey and, and be the last team standing, certainly in the East, you know, it's going to be a Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum-led uh, uh, journey. And lately, the pecking order between Jalen and Jason, it's been pretty cut and dry for the most part that Tatum is the number one and Jalen is at best maybe 1B, but more likely a 2. And... I'm not sure the lines of, of, of differentiation is, are as great as they used to be. Uh, when you look at, I go back to the Denver game, where one of the Jays showed up and was amazing, except from the free throw line. And then the other Jay didn't really show up from the free throw line, three-point line, you know, border lines on, on court. It, it, was a, it was just a hot mess for, for Tatum in that game. Uh, are we seeing a bit of a shift as far as where the Celtics are going to lean when it matters most, which is winning a championship? Are we seeing Jalen Brown starting to close that gap and maybe surpass Tatum as the guy for this team? Been interesting to see since the break because they flipped their shot totals. Brown's averaging 21 shots a game since the break. Tatum just 19. That's not something we've seen over the last three years. It's always been Tatum leading the charge offensively and Brown has been more of the focal point, uh, shooting 54%, averaging almost 30 a game. He's been incredible. So I don't think anyone's upset with seeing that be the dynamic uh, since the break. Tatum talked a little bit after the last game at home about, you know, stepping to the side if someone else has it going. I know he talked about that after the Denver game too, kind of explaining his struggles. Uh, So it's been interesting to watch, a little weird to watch, but I think a lot of it's been opportunistic uh, possessions from Brown and, I asked Joe about it at practice yesterday, and he said he would attribute some of the extra shots Brown's getting over Tatum uh, to transition opportunities, forcing the turnovers, like the breakout dunk against Phoenix. I think he's been so good on defense this year, at least compared to last year. Uh, So he's been aggressive. He's always aggressive. You'd like to see him hit more of the free throws as he's getting on the line. He's just 65% since the break. And his turnover assist ratio is really good this year. Over the stretch, it's 3.6 to 1.3. I mean, that's just... That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so he's he's better. And we've said this every year, Shred. It feels like we say it every month. But he's hitting a stride this year and he's found his role in the offense. Like I don't think he's taking over the offense and running it and you know drawing up pick and rolls and just leaving Tatum in the corner. I think a lot of it is them actually connecting. 
Uh, so Tatum's been up and down from the field. He's hitting his threes right now, which is good. So if you do get into a position where, you know, Brown's leading some of those sets and he's kicking out to Tatum, you know, you feel good about that. But right now it's, as we talked about earlier, you take out Tatum. If Brown has it going early, Brown usually has it going early in these games. So how do you keep Tatum involved early to the point where he's doing all the other little things? I think that's one of the questions we've been asking early is a lot of times Tatum doesn't have it going in the first quarter and he's stepping out of those games. A lot of times it's the first sub. So I've counted three games recently where they've actually taken Brown out early, left Tatum in, got him going. You had that Utah game where Brown sat. Tatum had like 15 points in that first quarter, which isn't typical, but it was refreshing to see. So it's a balance between those two. And, you know, I, again, I asked Joe about it and he's like, we're not saying that Tatum has to have the most shots. That's never the goal. It's about the matchups, making the right play and getting the ball where it needs to go. And a lot of times Brown has had the mismatches on him and he's just destroying these guys. Luka Doncic, I think the Celtics shot like 73% against him in that game. They shot like 64% against Anthony Simons in that Portland game. Destroy Jordan Clarkson in the next one. So they're finding that matchup every game. And a lot of times it's Brown going at those guys downhill and they are just crushing these guys, which is great because that's how they want to run their offense. Uh, so a lot of it's going to be the offense running itself. I've been refreshed. There's a lot of things I think we've liked about Joe this year, Sherrod, to say, all right, if a guy has it going, how can we get the ball to him in the flow of the offense? Right. Because guys have gotten lost before. Brown's had huge first quarters and then disappeared for the rest of those games. Tatum hasn't been able to get going until late in some of these games over the years. So it's always going to be a balance between those guys. Who's playing when? Do you take out a guy if he has it going? And... Joe basically said he's talking to those guys and seeing what they want to do. So that's going to be the question going into the playoffs. How do you get Tatum going earlier? How do you keep Brown going when he has it early as he often does? Yeah, and and I, I think Joe, for the most part, has done a decent job of, of balancing those two worlds. But there, there seems to be against some of those top tier opponents where uh, one of the two has it going significantly more than the other. And it feels as though Joe tries to kind of balance the scales of sorts of trying to get the guy who's struggling, put him in positions where he can get it going. And more times than not, it feels like that guy's Tatum. And more times than not, no matter what Joe tries, Tatum still doesn't quite get to that level of impact. And, and, and again, with, with Tatum, it, it really can't just be about scoring. He really has to be able to do other things. And and I think that's the one difference that we're seeing more times than not from Jalen is that even on those games where he's maybe misses 10, 11, 12 shots, what he's doing defensively allows him to still make his impact on the game. I mean, he, I, I don't know if we've ever, if the NBA has ever had like a most improved defensive player award, but Jalen Brown, if there ever was such an award, he would be a guy that would be definitely uh, a strong contender for that because his defense has really allowed him to become a more impactful player. Uh, and I'm still, and I think Jalen would, you know, I think he'd probably say the same thing. His role in terms of the offense is still a little bit unclear. Um, I think it's, there's clarity trending in that direction for yeah. more clarity, but I still think that there's a, a there's a kind of an uncertainty as to exactly what is it that we're looking to get from him other than making an impact. Uh, Cause to your point, Bobby, Jalen, I don't think hunts down the mismatches as much as I wish he did. Cause it's like, he'll knock down a couple of shots over Luca. And it's almost like Joe has to say, okay, guess what? Luca can't guard him. Keep feeding Jalen the ball guys. Cause he's got a matchup that they can't stop. Um, and it's, it takes him making three or four shots before he starts feeling like, okay, I own this matchup. Tatum doesn't need that. Tatum knocks down one shot. He's taking the next four or five to hell of high water. Um, it feels like there's still a level of balance that this team is still striving towards, even though they're winning a hell of a bunch of games. Yeah. And offensively, even though they're number one in efficiency all the time, they're 127 Sherrod points per 100 since the break. And there's a lot of conversation going on right now about, you know, scorings down around the league and right. refs aren't calling as much. And the Celtics have gone the other way. Everyone's going down and scoring and they're, almost seven points above Denver, who's number two since the break. So their offense has just been on fire, even with, you know, I don't know if the league's changing how they're calling stuff or they've, you know, put the word in on where they want offense to go, but it hasn't impacted the Celtics, for whatever reason. And Porzingis' absence, which is going to continue uh, on Sunday in Washington, that hasn't affected them. Yeah, I have a theory on that. I mean, I, I think the reason why the 
scoring has gone down for most teams except the Celtics because they're allowing guys to get away with more defensively now than I think they did maybe a month or two ago. And for an, a team that is already built to play hard level, high level play defensively and you've got the kind of scoring prowess that the Celtics have across the board. I mean, Drew Holiday is what your fifth option. And that's a guy that I think on most teams would be high teams, maybe even 20 point per game score. They're going to get a lot of points. If you're going to allow them to be physical as they want to be defensively. And so the, the rule changes or well, they don't call them rule changes, the rule modifications, the way the game is being called now, it definitely uh, is to the Celtics benefit. Um, but as we get near the end of this podcast, as the Celtics near the end of the regular season, uh, Joe's got some decisions to make uh, because he's got a team that has guys who are playing really well. And yet you've got some guys that you obviously want to make sure that you preserve their health as best you can before the playoffs. So we find ourselves with that that age old question in the NBA rest versus rhythm, which way do you lean? When you look at uh, what Joe is going to be deciding in the next couple of weeks, next month or so, which direction do you see him leaning a little bit more towards the, versus the other? They're going to sprinkle in some rest, and I think it's as encouraging as anything that on Sunday, Derek White's not playing. Like, if you're going to you rest him. Derek hates not playing. <laughs> I mean, other, yeah. than having, other than his wife having a baby, that's about the only time Derek is, like, cool without playing games. Yeah, so that tells you where they're going with that. And I, I love. I would love to see Tatum get a night off. The good thing is, even if they don't have a ton of rest down the stretch, they're beating teams so badly that you get some natural rest in those games mm -hmm. uh, from guys just playing 20, 25 minutes before the game's over. And, you know, they're sitting on the bench and, you know, get their ice on their knees. So that's, I think, going to be more often than not how they – you know, settle these guys down and limit their minutes. And in Porzingis's case, if you have an ailment that is impacting you at all, take your time. And I hear that's, you know, what's going on with him right now is they're just slowly ramping him up. So they're just taking their time with that. There's no urgency for him to get back. So, you know, if he continues to miss games here, I don't think that's a huge concern. And I think people would rather see him a thousand percent fresh for the playoffs. And it's allowed, as you were just talking about, the Celtics to get into some different looks, get some different players out there. I think that's a benefit to resting guys and, you know, taking nights off and seeing a Tillman, uh, seeing a Springer who we still haven't really seen here. Maybe we see him in Washington with Dwight out and you're able to kind of try lineups, try combinations try different play styles. I think since the West Coast trip without Porzingis, they've gotten into more flow, more actions, more passing, and that's been refreshing to see. So there's benefits to just having guys set out. It prepares you, let's say someone misses a night in the playoffs, to have other things to go to. And I think, you know, Sherrod, if you were going to bet, Porzingis is probably going to miss a game in the playoffs. Like, if you are going to bet, is he going to miss one game in the playoffs? I think you just have to expect that. So... Uh, you got to be ready for all this stuff. They got to have guys lined up to step up in other positions. I think that's going to be a big part of them winning the championship this year is whether they can integrate some bench guys into bigger roles when necessary. Because if this team's fully healthy, Sherrod, I'm, I'm getting pretty close to thinking they're going to do it. Come not there to, yet. Come on over, Bobby. We're ready for you. We're I'm not there you. yet. And I'm glad I held out because that Denver game showed there's still another level they need to get to. But man, if they're healthy, it's going to be challenging for anyone to beat them. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel good about their chances of getting out of the East. It's just you're hoping that the Western Conference and undergoes a kind of bloodbath that I think they will for as far as who is the last team standing out there, because there are legitimately four or five teams that you could make a case and no one will be surprised if they're the last team standing, uh, including the, the defending champion Denver Nuggets, who, again, swept the season series with the Celtics, showed why they're champions. Jokic is a handful. And then some there's a reason why the guys are two time MVP. So we 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 know they're definitely going to be uh, one of the teams that will, you know, if, if they're the team the Celtics face at the end of the road to win a championship, it's going to be a hard fought series. Uh, but to your point, Bobby, it's 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 going to be a team thing. Boston's having a deep roster, having a roster that's not just deep in terms of ability and talent, but deep in terms of, of experience, of having an experience of playing with each other. Uh, that's going to be really important. So, um 
Well, Bobby, uh, that is it for the podcast today. Uh, Let the people know all the many gazillion places that they can find your work (laughs) and otherwise, because I know there's a million. So I've made sure we set aside enough time for you to go through the roll call of what is the Bobby Manning Communications Empire. Yeah, let's rattle it off. CLNSmedia.com every night pretty much after games. Uh, BostonSportsJournal.com every Saturday. So there's a new piece out now on that offense declining around the league. Uh, Celticsblog.com occasionally as well. And then, of course, on the Garn Report after every game. And on off days, too, we just interviewed Richard White, which was a great conversation on there just yesterday. So uh, go check that out. He's got one thing he wants to see the Celtics do differently down the stretch that I thought was interesting. So uh, we had a big conversation about that and his tweeting and all the rest. I enjoyed that one. So uh, that's on Celtics All Access. Go subscribe over there on YouTube. Awesome, awesome. And yeah, just to close things out, one more shout out to Indeed.com, HelloFresh, and Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of CLNS Media Network. Uh, download this latest episode of the Big Three NBA podcast on all your favorite podcasting apps. For Bobby Manning, this is H. Rob Blakely. See you when we see you. Take care.